This is for educational purposes only. Happiness is free, and it's easier than you think. By Lester Levinson and Hale Doskin. Introduction. What is happiness? Quite simply put, happiness is you being yourself. Not the limited self that you pretend to be most of the time but the unlimited self that you are and have always been. This is the self that is always effortlessly present before, during, and after everything else that appears in your experience. You are the radiant yet changeless background that allows for everything else to exist. If that is true, you may be wondering, why is it so hard to discover and why have there been so many books written on the topic, including this one? The answer to that is not as simple. We have spent eons pretending to be anything but unlimited. In fact, we have become so good at this pretending to be limited that we have forgotten that it is just a game, a pretense. We now spend most of our time bolstering the illusion that we have created for ourselves, leaving very little time for the inner reflection that can set us free from this totally self-imposed and artificial sense of limitation. It takes tremendous energy to maintain the illusion that unlimited beingness is actually limited to the particular body, mind that you call yourself. No wonder, we are so exhausted most of the time. We have unlimited energy available to us, but instead of using this energy for good or to discover who we truly are, we use this energy to convince ourselves and others around us that we are limited, that we have personal problems. The late Lester Levinson, my friend and the co-author of Thiz's book, used to say that extraditing ourselves from this situation in which we all find ourselves is either simple or impossible. It is simple when we allow it to be easy. We can allow our energy to our inwards towards self-discovery and for loving acceptance of what is. It is impossible when we force our energy to our outwards. We fight against the world of our own creation and try to prove to everyone, including ourselves, that our world and its problems are real. Are you ready to make it simple? You probably are if you were attracted to read this book. This book is designed to guide you experientially to rediscover your ultimate happiness by uncovering the real unlimited you. The happiness that is you is totally independent of what you have or do not have, yet it improves your experience of whatever you have or don't have. This happiness that is you is also independent of what you do or do not do. Yet it makes your experience of whatever you do or don't do more enjoyable. This happiness really is who you are, and you can experience it for yourself by reading this book and following the simple suggestions contained within it. I know that you have probably heard promises like these before, and you may have often been disappointed, which, of course, could make you a little skeptical. If you are in doubt, that is okay. I encourage you to believe nothing that you read in this book until you can prove it for yourself. But I promise you that this program is different. I have the absolute conviction that you can uncover your ultimate happiness and live it in every moment. This conviction is based on my own direct experience over the last quarter century of working with Lester Levinson and his teachings and then sharing them with thousands of people around the world. Yet I did not always feel convinced. I met Lester Levinson in 1976. Back then I was an ardent, although confused seeker who had gone to many trainings and seminars led by teachers from both the East and the West. I had studied various body-centered disciplines, including yoga, tai chi, and shiatsu. I had actively participated in various courses, including EST, actualism, theta seminars, and rebirthing. I had many nice experiences at these seminars, and heard and understood, at least intellectually, many useful concepts. Still I felt incomplete. I longed for a simple and powerful answer to some important, yet vexing questions like, what is my life's purpose? What is truth? And who am I? Much of what I had heard and experienced only added to my questioning. No one seemed to have truly satisfying answers or have truly satisfied him or herself about what their true nature was or what was the ultimate truth. There was also a strong, almost universal belief that growing was hard work and required bearing your soul and reliving painful, unresolved issues. However, that all changed during a very fortunate encounter with a remarkable man. I met Lester at a seminar that I had organized for a well-known speaker, which Lester attended as the seminar leader's guest. That day, a group of us went out to lunch together, 
where Lester's presence immediately struck me as special. He was in total peace and equal mindedness, very comfortable with himself. He was unassuming and easy to talk to, and treated everyone as his friend, even me, a complete stranger. It was obvious that he had ended his search by discovering the answers I'd been seeking. I knew I had to find out more. When I asked Lester what he did, he invited me to a seminar that was being held the next weekend. All he would tell me about it was that, a group of people is going to sit around a table and release. I wasn't sure what that meant, but I knew if it could even point me in the direction of the qualities of which Lester was the living embodiment, I definitely wanted it. I took a leap of faith and signed up on the spot. Almost overnight I knew that I had found what I was looking for. In fact, Deep inside I knew that this process of releasing and Lester's teachings were what I had been born to do and share with the world, and to this day I have never wavered. Before we move on to explore more of what you can expect from this book, I would like to share Lester's story with you in his own words. The quote that follows is very similar to the story that Lester unfolded for me shortly after I met him and started exploring his teachings. I was born July 19, 1909. In Elizabeth, New Jersey, into a middle class family as a very shy person. I tried to do things the way they were supposed to be done, doing the right thing, getting a good education, and being the best in my eld. My natural inclination was towards science, especially the science of the world, and of man himself. I graduated from Rutgers University in 1931 as a physicist after which I worked twenty-some years in physics and engineering. In physics, I worked in research and development on measuring instruments and automatic control, connected with Brown Instrument Company, which later became a subsidiary of Honeywell, and in the engineering field, I worked as a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, a construction engineer, a heating and venting engineer, and a marine engineer, actually, fourteen different Elds. I also went into various businesses, including restaurants, lumber, building, and oil, intertwined with engineering, wanting to make money, wanting to make it in the world. At that time, I did not know what I now know, that what I was seeking was actually the answers to life itself. Nothing that I had worked at would give me that answer, and as the years went by, I became heavy with depression and with sickness. By 1952, I had been through constant illness, I even had jaundice, three or so times a year. I had an enlarged liver, kidney stones, spleen trouble, hyper and hypoacidity, ulcers that perforated and formed lesions, and to top it off, I had at least ten years of migraine headaches. This all culminated in 1952 when I had my second coronary thrombosis. After the second coronary, I was told I would not live much longer, that I might die any day and shouldn't make the effort to take so much as a step unless I necessarily had to. I was extremely fearful of dying, but I said to myself, you're still breathing, Lester, there is still a chance. So I sat down and began thinking on an around the clock basis. Having lived 42 or so years, and having reached the end of the line without happiness, without health, I realized that all the knowledge I had accumulated was of no avail. I had studied Watson's behaviorism in the 30s and Freud's in the late 30s and early 40s. I had studied the philosophies. I had studied logic. I studied economics. I studied all the major elves of man, and with all that knowledge there, I was at the end of the line. This made me realize that the accumulated knowledge of man was of no use. So I decided to start from scratch. Forget all that knowledge. Begin from point zero and see what you can pick up. So, I posed the questions, what am I? What is this world? What is my relationship to it? What is mind? What is intelligence? What is happiness? I began by asking myself, what do I want out of life? And the answer was happiness. Investigating further, I went into the moment when I was feeling happiest. I discovered something which to me was startling at the time. It was when I was loving that I was happiest. That happiness equated to my capacity to love rather than to being loved. That was a starting point. I began correcting all my thoughts and feelings in that direction from that of wanting to be loved to that of loving. And in that process, 
I discovered another major thing that kind of shocked me. I saw that I wanted to change this entire world, and that was the cause of my ulcers, or one of the major causes. In realizing how much I wanted to change things in this world, I saw how it made me a slave of this world. I made the decision to reverse that, and in the process of following out these two directions, actually unloading all the subconscious concepts and pressures in those directions, I discovered I was getting happier, freer, lighter, and feeling better in general. As I saw this direction was good, I made the decision that if a slice of pie tasted this good, I wanted the whole pie, and I decided not to let go of this direction until I got that entire pie of happiness and with it the answer to, what am I, what is this life, and what is my relationship to it. This decision allowed me, as I claim, to get the answer to life itself in a matter of only three months. I believe if I can do it, anyone can do it if they have that much want to. In that three, month period, all the ailments I had in my physical body corrected, all my miseries dropped away, and I ended up in a place in which I was happy all the time, without sorrow, not that the world stopped pushing against me, it continued, but I was at a place where I could resolve things almost immediately, having cleared out the negative fears, all the negative I cannots, I would focus right on the answer to every problem, and get it very quickly, and so, my whole life turned around from being depressed and sick, to being happy all the time, and being in perfect health all the time. One of the things that happened in this process was my identity. Cation with others. I saw that we are all related, we are all interconnected. Each mind is like a radio broadcasting and receiving station, that we are all tuned into each other unconsciously, that we are just not aware of it. As a lot of the suppressed energies are let out. This becomes obvious to us and once we identify with everyone else it is just natural that we want everyone else to discover what we have discovered. That life was meant to be beautiful. Meant to be happy all the time with no sorrow, and to be with perfect health. And so after reaching that high point of understanding in 1952, I have wanted to help others to discover what I had discovered. I was deeply moved by Lester's story because it offered hope for all of us who may not have had the good fortune to have an ideal life. Lester was able to discover his true nature in a relatively short time and despite extreme adversity. If he could do it, I knew that I could, too. The following quote is Lester expanding more about his actual realization. I was at the end of my rope. I was told not to take a step unless I absolutely had to because there was a possibility that I could drop dead at any moment. This was a terrible, shocking thing, suddenly to be told that I couldn't be active anymore, having been so active all my life. It was a horrible thing. An intense fear of dying overwhelmed me. The fear that I might drop dead any minute. This stayed with me for days. I went through a real, horrible, low spinning period there, in the grip of intense fear of dying or of being a cripple for the rest of my life in that I wouldn't be able to be active. I felt that life would not be worthwhile anymore. This caused me to conclude with determination, either I get the answers, or it'll take me off this earth. No heart attack will do it. I had a nice easy way to do it, too. I had morphine the doctors gave me for my kidney stone attacks. After several days of this intense fear of dying, I suddenly realized, well, I'm still alive, as long as I'm alive there's hope, as long as I'm alive, maybe I can get out of this, what do I do? Well, I was always a smart boy, always made the honor roll, even got myself a four, year scholarship to Rutgers University at a time when scholarships were very rare through competitive examinations. But what does this avail me? Nothing. Here I am with all this brilliance as miserable and scared as can be. Then I said, Lester, you were not only not smart, you were dumb, dumb, dumb. There's something wrong in your intellect. With all your knowledge, you've come to this bottom end. Drop all this knowledge you've so studiously picked up on philosophy, psychology, social science, and economics. It is of no avail. Start from scratch. Begin all over again your search for the answers. And with an extreme desperation and intense wanting out, not wanting to die, I began to question, 
What am I? What is this world? What is my relationship to it? What do I want from it? Happiness. Well, what is happiness? Being loved. But I am loved. I know several very desirable girls with beauty, charm, and intellect who want me, and I have the esteem of my friends. Yet, I'm miserable. I sensed that the closest thing related to happiness was love. So I began reviewing and reliving my past love affairs, looking at the points where the little happiness that I had were. I began to pull up and dissect all my high moments of loving. Suddenly, I got an inkling that it was when I was loving that I had the highest feeling. I remembered one evening, a beautiful balmy evening in the mountains when I was camping with my girlfriend. We were both lying on the grass, both looking up at the sky and I had my arm around her. The nirvana, the perfection of the height of happiness was right there. I was feeling how great is love for my girlfriend, how wonderful is knowing all this nature, how perfect setting. And I saw that it was my loving her that was the cause of this happiness, not the beauty of the setting or being with my girlfriend. Then I immediately turned to the other side. Boy it was great when she loved me. I remembered the moment when publicly this beautiful, Charming girl told the world that she approved of Lester, she loved Lester, and I could feel that nice feeling of approval, but I sensed that it was not as great as what I had just discovered. It was not a lasting feeling, it was just for the moment. In order for me to have that feeling continuously, she had to continue saying that. So, this momentary ego approval was not as great as the feeling of loving her. As long as I was loving her, I felt so happy. But when she loved me, there were only moments of happiness when she gave me approval. Days of further cogitation gradually revealed to me that this was correct. I was happier when I loved her than I was when I got that momentary ego satisfaction when she loved me. Her loving me was a momentary pleasure that needed constant showing and proving on her part, while my loving her was a constant happiness. As long as I was loving her, I concluded that my happiness equated to my loving. If I could increase my loving, then I could increase my happiness. This was the first inkling I had as to what brings about happiness. And it was a tremendous thing because I hadn't had happiness. And I said, gee, if this is the key to happiness, I've got the greatest. Even the hope of getting more and more happiness was a tremendous thing, because this was the number one thing I wanted happiness. That started me on weeks and weeks of reviewing my past love affairs. I dug up from the past, incident after incident when I thought I was loving, and I discovered that I was being nice to my girlfriends, trying to get them to love me, and that that was l s h. That was not really love. That was just wanting my ego bolstered. I kept reviewing incidents from the past, and where I saw that I was not loving, I would change that feeling to loving that person. Instead of wanting them to do something for me, I would change it to my wanting to do something for them. I kept this up until I couldn't find any more incidents to work on. This insight on love, seeing that happiness was determined by my capacity to love, was a tremendous insight. It began to free me, and any bit of freedom when your plague feels so good. I knew that I was in the right direction. I had gotten hold of a link of the chain of happiness and was determined not to let go until I had the entire chain. I felt a greater freedom. There was an easier concentration of my mind because of it, and I began to look better at my mind. What is my mind? What is intelligence? Suddenly, a picture. Ashton Amusement Park Bumper, cars that are difficult to steer so that they continually bump into each other. They all get their electrical energy from the wire screen above the cars through a pole coming down to every car. The power above was symbolic of the overall intelligence and energy of the universe coming down the pole to me and everyone else, and to the degree we step on the gas do we use it. Each driver of the cars is taking the amount of energy and intelligence that he wants from that wire but he steers his car blindly and bumps into other cars, and bumps and bumps. I saw that if I chose to, I could take more and more of that overall intelligence. And so I dug into that. I began to examine thinking and its relationship to what was happening. And it was revealed that everything that was happening had a prior thought behind it and that I never before related the thought and the happening because of the element of time between the two. When I saw that everything that was happening to me had a thought of it before it happened, I realized that if I could grab hold of this, 
I could consciously determine everything that was happening to me, and above all, I saw that I was responsible for everything that had happened to me, formerly thinking that the world was abusing me, I saw that my whole past life, and all that tremendous effort to make money and in the end, failing, was due only to my thinking. This was a tremendous piece of freedom, to think that I was not a victim of this world, that it lay within my power to arrange the world the way I wanted it to be, that rather than being an effect of it, I could now be at cause over it and arrange it the way I would like it to be. That was a tremendous realization, a tremendous feeling of freedom. I was so ill when I started my searching, I had one foot in the grave, and when I saw that my thinking was cause for what was happening to me, I immediately saw my body from my chin down to my toes as perfect, and instantly, I knew it was perfect. I knew the lesions and adhesions of my intestine due to perforated ulcers were undone. I knew everything within me was in perfect running order. And it was, discovering that my happiness equated to my loving, discovering that my thinking was the cause of things happening to me in my life gave me more and more freedom. Freedom from unconscious compulsions that I had to work, I had to make money, and I had to have girls. Freedom in the feeling that I was now able to determine my destiny, I was now able to control my world, I was now able to arrange my environment to suit me. This new freedom lightened my internal burden so greatly that I felt that I had no need to do anything. Plus, the new happiness I was experiencing was so great. I was experiencing a joy that I had never known existed. I had never dreamed happiness could be so great. I determined if this is so great, I'm not going to let go of it until I carry it all the way. I had no idea how joyous a person could be. So, I began digging further on how to extend this joy. I began further changing my attitudes on love. I would imagine the girl I wanted most marrying one of my friends, or the boy I would want her to marry least, and then enjoy their enjoying each other. To me, this was the extreme in loving, and if I could achieve it, it would give me more of this wonderful thing that I was experiencing. And so I worked on it. I took a particular fellow, Burl, and a particular girl, and I wouldn't let go until I could really feel the joy of their enjoying each other. Then I knew I had it, or almost had it. Then later on, I had further tests of this in talking to people who were opposing me on and when I was trying to help them, I would consciously feel the greatest love for them when they were attacking me. And the joy of loving them was so wonderful, I would, without any thought, thank them so profusely for having given me the opportunity of talking with them that it threw them into a dither. But I really felt that. I thanked them from the bottom of my heart for having given me the opportunity of loving them when they were making it as difficult as they possibly could. I didn't express that to them. I just thanked them for the opportunity of having been able to talk with them. That I was able to do this was good news to me because, like other things, I was able to carry loving to the extreme. I could love people who were opposing me, and I would not stop until I could see the end of the line of this happiness I was getting. I would go higher and higher and higher and say, oh, my gosh, there can be nothing higher than this. But I would dry, and, I would go higher. Then I would say, oh, there can't be anything higher than this. But I would try, and go higher, and then say, oh. There can't be anything happier than this. Until I realized there was no limit to happiness, I would get incapacitated. I could look at my body, and I couldn't move it I was so top heavy with ecstasy and joy. I was actually incapacitated. I would do this for hours, going higher and higher and then I would have to work for hours to keep coming down and down and down until I could start being the body again in order to operate it. Contemplating the source of intelligence and energy. I discovered that energy, as well as intelligence was available in unlimited amounts, and that it came simply by my freeing myself from all compulsions, inhibitions, entanglements, hang-ups. I saw that I had dammed up this energy, this power, and all I had to do was pry loose the logs of the dam which were my compulsions and hang-ups, and that was what I did. As I let go of these things, I was removing logs and allowing this infinite energy to Ow, just like a water dam. Oh, if you pull the logs out, one by one, the more logs you pull out, 
the greater the flow. All I needed to do was to remove these logs and let the infinite power and energy. Ow, seeing this, the power that was right behind my mind was allowed to. Ow, through like it had never. Owed before. There were times when I'd get this realization of what I am that would put so much energy into me. I would just jump up in the air from my chair. I would go right straight out the front door, and I would start walking and walking and walking, for hours at a time, sometimes for days at a time. I just felt as though my body would not contain it, that I had to walk or run some of it off. I remember walking the streets of New York City in the wee hours of the morning, just walking at a very good pace and not being able to do anything otherwise, I had to expend some of that energy, it was so tremendous, I saw that the source of all this energy, of all intelligence was basically harmonious, and that harmony was the rule of the universe, and that was why the planets were not colliding, and that was why the sun rose every day, and that was why everything functioned, when I started my search, I was a very convinced and absolute materialist, the only thing that was real was that which you could feel and touch, my understanding of the world was as solid as concrete, and when some of these revelations came to me that the world was just a result of my mind, that thinking determined all matter, that matter had no intelligence, and that our intelligence determined all matter and everything about it, when I saw that the solidity that I formerly had was only a thought itself, my nice, solid, concrete foundations began to crack, twenty years of build up began to tumble, and my body shook, and shook so much, I just shook for days, I shook just like a nervous old person, I knew that the concrete view I had had of the world was never going to be again, but it didn't drop away gracefully, with ease, for days, I actually shook, until I think I shook the whole thing loose, then, my view was just the opposite of what it had been months previously, that the real solid thing was not the physical world, was not my mind, but something, that was much greater, the very essence, the very beingness of me was the reality, it had no limits, it was eternal, and all the things that I saw before were the least of me, rather than the all of me, the all of me was my beingness, I saw that the only limitations I had were the ones that I accepted, so, wanting to know what am I, and looking for this unlimited being that I had had an inkling of, I got in sight of this tremendous unlimited being that I am, and on seeing that, I right there and then realized, well, I'm not this limited body and I thought I was, I am not this mind with its limitations that I thought I was. And I undid all body limitation, and almost all mind limitation, just by saying, I am not it, finished, done period, that's it. I so declared, it was obvious to me that I wasn't that body and mind that I had thought I was, I just saw, that's all, it's simple when you see it, I let go of identifying with this body, and when I did that, I saw that my beingness was all beingness, that beingness is like one grand ocean, it's not chopped up into parts called drops of bodies dot it's all one ocean, this caused me to identify with every being, every person and even every atom in this universe, then you are, nished forever with separation and all the hellishness that's caused only by separation, then you can no more be fooled by the apparent limitations of the world, you see them as a dream, as an appearancy because you know that your very own beingness has no limits, in reality, the only thing that is, is beingness, that is the real, changeless substance behind everything, everything of life itself was open to me, the total understanding of it, it is simply that we are infinite beings, over which we have superimposed concepts of limitation, the logs of the dam, and we are smarting under these limitations that we accept for ourselves as though they are real, because they are opposed to our basic nature of total freedom, life before and after my realization was at two different extremes, before, it was just extreme depression, intense misery, and sickness, after, it was a happiness and serenity that's indescribable, life became so beautiful and so harmonious that all day, every day, everything would fall perfectly into line, as I would drive through New York City, I would rarely hit a red light, when I would go to park my car, people, sometimes two or three people, 
would stop and even step into the street to help direct me into a parking space. There were times when taxi cab drivers would see me looking for a parking space and would give up their space for me. And after they did, they couldn't understand why they had done it. Though they were, double parked. Even policemen who were parked would move out and give me their parking place. And again, after they did, they couldn't understand why. But I knew they felt good in doing so, and they would continue to help me. If I went into a store, the salesman would happily go out of his way to help me. Or, if I would order something in a restaurant and then change my mind, the waitress would bring what I wanted even though I hadn't told her. Actually everyone moves to serve you as you just out around. When you are in tune and you have a thought, every atom in the universe moves to fulfill your thought. And this is true. Being in harmony is such a delightful, delectable state, not because things are coming your way, but because of the feeling of God, in operation. It's a tremendous feeling, you just can't imagine how great it is. It is such a delight when you're in tune, in harmony, you see God everywhere. You're watching God in operation. And that is what you enjoy, rather than the time, the incident, the happening. His operation is the ultimate. When we get in tune, our capacity to love is so extreme that we'll love everyone with an extreme intensity that makes living the most delightful it could ever be. When I found the quote above, I was deeply moved, and as I worked to put this book together I knew it was important for you to be exposed to it as well so you could appreciate the point of view from which Lester did his teaching. Lester dedicated the rest of his life, from 1952 through his death in 1994, as he put it, to helping the rest of him discover what had discovered. He joyously lived for others without any sense of sacrifice tirelessly working to help them to discover their true nature or at least let go of their suffering. Despite his best intentions he was not always understood. He used to say, you only hear 10% of what I say, which, in my experience working with him and watching how others related to him, was quite generous. In fact, the very people that he helped the most often vehemently opposed him. But this never deterred him nor did it ever shake his unqualified happiness and peace. He worked with people on a one-to-one -one basis and in small groups, teaching sessions very much like those you will experience in this book, until, around 1974, with the help of some of his closest students, he summarized his teaching into a do-it-yourself system that we now call the seed in a method registered. He did this to take himself out of the teaching loop, no matter how often he protested to the contrary. His students would often attribute their gains and realizations to him because they felt so elevated in his presence. He wanted everyone to know that they could discover just what he had on their own without needing an external teacher. As you read this book and work with the material contained within it, you will have a direct experience of Lester's teaching style through his words and their import. This is significant because it is something that very few people were lucky enough to experience during the last 20 years of his life. You will also have the benefit of seeing how his teachings have evolved since the creation of the seed in a method registered and in the work of his students since his passing. Before Lester died, he asked me to continue his work and to continue to find ways to make the experience of letting go more readily available to those who are interested. That is why I have added some commentary and suggestions at the end of each session. I hope you will find these as helpful as I did. I urge you to treat this book as a home study course in discovering your true nature and uncovering your innate happiness. You can benefit from this book even if you only read it casually, but if you dedicate yourself to using it to the fullest, the results you can achieve will astound you.